All right. Well, I'm going to just crack in um, and people can join as we go. Um, my name is James Blackwood. I work with Giraffe. Um, I'm based here in Orlando, Florida, and it's starting to get pretty hot. Um, but we chose, I chose Orlando as the starting point for this discussion. Um, the use case will apply anywhere. But Orlando is really interesting because it has its downtown core has really significantly emptied after um, COVID. So there is a lot of big changes happening in that market, in the office market, but then resulting resi market. So it's very topical. And we're going to dive into uh, a couple of, or one use case in particular, and then we'll transplant that to a major metro um, after we've set up our template in, in Orlando. Um, if you do have questions, I really want to hear them. I am by no means an expert on Office to Resi uh, transitions, and I'm sure that most of the people on this call are far more um, skilled and empowered to, to give real advice on this. Um, my goal here is to show how Giraffe can stitch together the complex pieces of this very bizarre puzzle. And it's a weird puzzle because it's the intersection of um, a number of different uh, factors that need to be considered in order to move a building from one use to another. And, you know, so much time and energy goes into design and planning buildings for a specific use. So to just willy nilly start converting them across the city is obviously um, fraught with, with uh, problems. So the five kind of issues we're, we're going to look at are um, can be qualified into I think nice little buckets and corresponding features within Giraffe. Um, so the first issue is, is there a market here um, for this product? If we're to, you know, like there's a, a commercial building on the side of uh, the interstate here, no one's going to convert that to multifamily. It's just never, it would never work. No one would ever want to live there. So is it appealing to place to live? Um, do people want to live there? And then will the rent support the project? Um, of an absolute conversion. Two is a policy issue. And, you know, a lot of cities now, Washington DC has basically come out saying that they'll help uh, building owners transition from one use to the other. They've identified something like only 10% of buildings in DC are fit for uh, transformation. Um, but do the planning policies permit the kind of use that you're trying to transition to? And if not, what's the the risk in terms of uh, making that transition. So what's the future land use? Does it fit within the general plan? Um, uh, or, you know, is the city got some kind of policy around conversions for their downtown core? The hardest one, which is also can be solved relatively simply, but is, is the floor plan of the building um, appropriate to transform? And when you look at an office building, you know, often they have, they have a center core, and it's a very deep uh, core to window ratio, uh, as in that distance is very long. So if you were to put apartments in there, you know, they're gonna end up being long skinny apartments uh, or gigantic penthouses. And the, the um, I've spoken to a lot of folks about this use case and the, the, the buildings that end up penciling the best are option, often extreme luxury type penthouse deals. I heard of one in um, Chicago that, uh, you know, a large national architectural firm worked on and basically the whole building is filled with professional basketball players because that's all that they could those, those were the only clientele that would buy the units um, and so one of the entire floors is a basketball arena i mean it's actually pretty cool but that's not a common use case so that's dictated generally speaking by where is the core and how much space do we have between the core and the facade and then fourth and obviously this is the factor that drives um drives all decisions in real estate is, does it commercially make sense? Um, what is the building valued at as a commercial proposition? I mean, it's gonna have its operating incomes right now. And if we change it to um, multifamily, then I'm gonna to have to invest more money. And does the resulting asset end up being worth more than the current asset? Um, and the reason really mainly people looking at this is because operating incomes for commercial are diving. So there is a deal to be made. And that that really is the question here that we're trying to answer is, is there a deal to be made in office to resi conversion or is it too far-fetched? 
So let's just get into it. That's enough talking. I've spoken about the concept here for six minutes. Let's do some showing. Um, I am here in Orlando and I've done a couple of things just as preparation for this call. I've connected to Regrid. Regrid is all of the parcel data for um, North America. It's awesome. The building I've chosen is one that fits in a nice, really nice part of Orlando, south of Lake Eola. This is the traditional downtown core here. And then this is sort of like a, uh, an old city style neighborhood that has office buildings and resi buildings. There's one right there. Um, this particular building is currently uh, an office use. And my question is what would happen if we turn this into multifamily? So let's get going. Um, I'm gonna create a project here based on the regrid parcel data. So I'm gonna just select that and say, add to selection. And <clears throat> I'm gonna uh, drop down here and say, use selection. Actually, you know what? I'm just gonna say, right click on this uh, and we'll turn this into my uh, project boundary. Sorry, forgive me. I've skipped a step here. I will say save project as and I could give it a name, we'll call this Office to Resi Template. All right, so now I saved this project. And like I said, I brought in some additional data to help me. So using Draft's um, ability to just quickly and easily connect to GIS repositories, I connected to the City of Orlando's GIS database and I brought in their um, future land use and, and current land use actually. So if we look at what the current zoning is, it's zoned as PDT, and that means plan development. So obviously someone's had this idea because I actually think this one works um, and they're either gonna transition it or they're gonna knock it down and build something new. Uh, however, if we look at the future land use, and this is something that I would um, encourage you to do um, for most of the development projects that you do, I'll turn down 3D buildings. We can see that the parcel actually fits into uh, a neighborhood that Orlando are hoping to get residential high density in. So actually this is the perfect little spot for us to be looking at um, to transform this building from office to resi. Okay, so let's turn regrid off and start setting up the basics. So the second question, or uh, I guess I should say, the first question I had was, does the market support what we wanna build here? So I'm going to just open up Local Logic. Local Logic is one of our partners um, in the area in in the United States who have a ton of demographic data. And this little app just basically says, "Okay, show me all of the folks within a five minute radius of a walkable radius of the project we just drew. Show me their average incomes, um, how employed they are, how educated they are, whether they're owning versus renting, and you can see just from this quick top level view." We've got high income earners, quite a lot of high income earners, a um, fair number of people, it's relatively dense. Uh, they're very well educated and most of them are renting. So we could say, uh, you know, I think there's a good bet that our product here will, will go. Um, and just for argument's sake, I also opened up Zillow to see what's renting. There's not a heap of supply in the area. There's a few little spots here and there. There's this big old building, but it doesn't have any views of the lake. Um, and the, the ones that do have views of the lake, there's only like four or five units available at the moment. Um, and they typically fetch between two and a half and three, depending on the size of the unit. So let's take that learning and plug that into our metrics. Uh, I'll turn down the future land use and I'll come back to our um, template here, put our building back on. And I'm just gonna go through our assumptions right now. So I'm gonna look at our one bedroom units and this is in our future use of this building, what do we think the market rents are gonna be? We just have a look on zero, Zillow that two bedders are about two and a half. So let's put our one bedders at 2000 and our two bedders at 2400, whoop, not 3400, 2400. And our three bedders at 3000. I think that's fairly conservative, but we'll, we'll go with it anyway. And my studios, we're going to put in at 1800. Okay, that's a monthly rental yield for each of the dwelling types that I just popped in. Um, and we'll come back to that in a minute, but based on what we've seen in the market, yes, there's high income earners who love to rent in this market. There's, seems like there's not heaps of supply. 
um, and we're going to um, uh, build some new product here that we think will rent for some good money. So that's our first question answered. Second question is policy and zoning. I've already answered that. You can see um, future land use is right in our wheelhouse. So the city are gonna be supportive of this transformation. Three is the complex one. How do we make this thing work from a design perspective? So let's give it a go. I'm gonna take the existing building, I'll just right click on it and hit create. And the create, um, what create's gonna give me the option to do is query any shape that's on the giraffe uh, 3D buildings layout, or really any vector for that matter. And you'll see it's giving me the floor plate area. I'm just gonna say this is commercial. And let's zoom out and have a look at how many levels it is. I'll just crank it all the way to the top. There we go, it's 23 levels. All right, so if we turn off 3D buildings, and we may be out by two or three levels there, but I would say that's probably about right. So there's our, there our basis for this building. Oh, and the other thing I think we need to do to establish our basis is get our commercial rents. Um, so the, the actual building is leasing right now, but it won't tell me what the square footages are. Um, I can see this commercial building up here is 25 bucks a square foot. Um, there is a rental office here for 30. There's another one over here for 30. So let's, let's assume, let's be generous to the commercial use case here. Let's say that the net rent is about 32 bucks a square foot. Okay. And we're gonna zero out all these costs because uh, we don't need those in this particular use case. The building is already built. All right, so we've established a foundation. We have our future rents, we have our current rents, we have our building, its square footages, uh, and that's gonna form the business case of what the value is today. We'll come back to that in a minute. Let's spend some time though, just thinking about, is this even worth considering from a design perspective? If I turn the building off and turn the satellite on, we can get a good sense of where the core is. And actually I am looking at a different building to what I thought I was gonna be looking at and it's clearly already multifamily. So that's a shame, but that's okay. We'll, pursue, we'll persist. I think I was doing this building earlier. Oh, well. So we can turn this guy on and say, um, where do we think the core is gonna be? I'm gonna add a new drawing layer. And generally speaking from the, uh, well, we'll call this multi-family scenario. From the uh, aerial photo, we can position the core relatively well. It's gonna be somewhere in the middle if it's center core uh, and it's gonna be pretty big. So I'll turn the building envelope back on from commercial and I'll grab from my list of drawing tools, a core. Now, just for argument's sake, we'll turn the satellite on semi-transparent and we'll say that the core sits somewhere around here and it's this kind of shape. Rectangular, sits in the middle, takes up quite a lot of room because it's very tall, needs um, a ton of elevators to get into it. And we want that to also be 23 levels. Okay, so turning off my 3D building, you can see there's my core in the center, but it's too short. So the floor to floor I have for commercial versus resi is different. And that would make sense if we were building it from scratch. However, this is a conversion. So we need to look at it um, as though it's the same floor to floor as everything else. So let's go adjust that real quick. I'll go find my floor to floors. Actually, I'll do it for all of the residential usages at once. I'll come to uh, the usage editor in the table view. We'll pop over to floor to floor. And let's look at what commercial is. It's currently at 12 and a half. I'm just gonna rip through all of these and change them to 12 and a half. So there's the studio units done. Uh, one, two, three betters is down here. Perfect. And now I also need to do the core and the corridor. All right. So now all my ceilings are the same height. And when I save this, you'll see now the core goes all the way to the top. So that that aligns, that checks out. You'll notice this second drawing layer I've done is uh, called multifamily scenario. And the active layer that I'm drawing on is listed down here. 
The next thing I want to do is place some apartments and I want to place them either side of the core and try and figure out what efficiency I can gain from this floor plate. Because a big issue is going to be either side of the core here where we have these long, narrow stretches uh, that will make for terrible apartments. So to do this, I could obviously draw one, two, three bedrooms, you know, uh, manually. I'm actually going to use the apartment algorithm. So I click on the lightning bolt algorithms, apartments. I want to keep all the assumptions that I've already keyed in. And I'm just going to draw a line. And that line is going to be wrong because the first thing it'll do is draw an apartment building and we don't want that. So holding shift A, I can override the algorithm. First thing I want to do is make this single loaded because we're not going to want apartments to overlap on the core. So shift A, I drag the left side in. Now at this point, I could make a decision about whether I want end caps in there or not. I don't know yet, so let's leave them on. And I will drop this down to about the same height. And then let's just drag it on and see what happens. So as I drag that inside the current envelope, you can see a few things happening. One, we've gone too far into the core. Oh, and if you didn't know about this little trick, I'm going to take the default layer that has the commercial envelope on it and I'm going to hit lock. Now I can't click on that or do anything to it, which is very nice. So let's drag our corridor just to the right a little bit. And then you can see I'm sticking out of the envelope. So let's drag this back. And just so you can see, I'm getting some visual feedback on how deep these apartments are. 33 and a half feet is pretty good for um, this particular use case. It's like not too deep. We could probably steal some efficiency back by um, kicking the corridor in like an L shape and coming back like this. But we would only really get another four or five feet on these apartments because too much further, you know, around 40 feet, they become impractical. All right, so let's extrude that up to 23 levels. Beautiful. And then I'm just going to copy paste and flip this around on this side. And slot that right in there. Beautiful. And then I've got, you can see, this is the issue. This is, even this building, which is already multifamily, uh, has an issue here where it's it's not quite optimized for this space here and this space here. Um, and so what are we gonna do about that? Well, first of all, we need to draw in probably a two better that is gonna sit in the gap, but it's certainly not gonna go all the way back there, right? An 80 foot deep apartment would be terrible for light circulation. So let's just have it go about 40 feet back. And we'll, again, we'll up this to 23 levels. Um, and then we'll do the same on the other side. Okay. So that's actually a pretty efficient building. And if you can see, I've got a 391 unit yield. Um, and I'm going to actually do a couple more things. One, I just want to see how much communal space we'll have here in these voids. And we'll pop that up to 23 and then we'll do another one. I'm just holding S here, guys, to snap to the edges, get the exact space that I've got. Community. 23, and then same down here. Hitting P for polygon, S for snap, and it's just giving me exactly what I need to slot into that gap. It's not perfect, but it will get us very, very close. All right, so uh, we should adjust the floor to floor for a community back to 12.5. And Boom, there is our fully optimized floor plane. Okay, so this one actually comes close. We can see it's relatively efficient. We're getting quite a lot of units. Um, we have sufficient core space. We have this amenity on both sides of the building. Potentially that's not the best use of space. We could kick this back in an L and, and put some more units in there, but I think it would be minimal. I don't think we get more units, but we may get bigger units. So let's pause there for a second, okay? We've, we've designed something that works. A lot of buildings are going to be way too deep for this. 
and I could show you some use cases at the end of the call where it's way too deep. This just happens to work, it's really nice. <clears throat> but now we need to think about the financials of this. How much is it gonna cost us to convert? And is that going to screw us on the, um, uh, on the valuation of the building at the other side? Because if it's worth more as an office building, even at 60%, then you know, there's no, it's, it's a non-starter. We're not gonna put any capital into it. So let's use analytics to do that. We've gone and built a great data foundation. We have a scenario where it's multifamily. We have a scenario where it's commercial. So let's start building out some analytics. The first thing I wanna just have a quick look at is, um, let's assign a cost to everything. Actually, sorry, let's not do that. Let's look at the commercial building first. Let's try and get a, a valuation on this building uh, as an asset. So I'm gonna build a template Oh, sorry, a, a category, and we'll call this seller's expectation. And we're going to flip roles here for a second. We're going to pretend that we're uh, the owner of this building. Our occupancies are declining, and we want to understand what the building is worth. If we take a very straightforward look at um, the building's incomes, net operating income can be described as, so we'll call this net operating incomes. It can be described pretty easily as what is the net area of this building? What are the net rents in this building? And then what are our operating expenses and occupancies? So let's actually just start, we'll do this one by one. We'll call this um, rental, potential rental yield. If we were 100% optimized, we'll put this in dollars. And it applies only to usages that have the net rent field. And the only one that does in this project is commercial. So you can see it's giving me a result. Everything else is, is empty. So it's giving me about 14 and a half mil, which is great. However, the devil is in the details. So let's go in and add in an expense ratio. Uh, actually, let's start with occupancy. So I'll say, first thing I want to do is grab that potential rental yield count. And we'll, we'll assume a certain occupancy ratio. Let's say, let's start with 25%. So we'll say um, net yield after occupancy. And we'll make it dollary dues. And we're gonna take the potential rental yield, which is A, and multiply it by 0 0.75. That's gonna give us our net, uh, net, potential rent, we still haven't factored in operating expenses. So then we'll do another calculation and we'll say, let's take that net yield and we'll call this NOI, which is after our operating expenses of 15%. So multiply by 85% to give us our actual net operating incomes. Okay, now I know this is a simplistic model. There's other ways to value buildings. This is the way we're going to do it for this exercise, just to give, keep it all in one straight line. Um, okay, so we're down to nine and a half, which is a lot. And now we just want to get a quick cap rate or a, a quick building valuation using a cap rate. And I'm going to use um, numbers that I read out of a CBRE report. Again, they're probably incorrect. I don't, I'm not sure what the market's at today, but um, it will be good enough for this uh, demonstration. So I'm gonna grab that NOI and let's assume commercial buildings are uh, have a cap rate of six and a half in Orlando. So we'll say A divided by 6.5 multiplied by 100. And there's our, our building value. Okay, that's probably too low for this market, but we'll, we'll carry on anyway. Okay, wonderful. So that's what, uh, no building value, not cap rate. I'm doing too much thinking and talking at the same time. So to the seller, that's what that building is worth. Now let's change gears and think about it from the other side. If we're looking at this as a buyer, and I'm gonna to have to put capital into this building in order to convert it, what is the building worth to me? So the first thing we wanna do is try and figure out, okay, assuming we can do the design that we've proposed, assuming the core doesn't have any weird issues and there's no structural things that we need to change, what is the simplest thing we can do on this building? 
So we'll do the same kind of calculation, but we'll do it now for uh, the new multifamily buildings. And the reason we're doing this is because we think occupancy is going to be effectively 95%. So we'll say potential multifamily yield. It's in dollary dues. And I want to take the dwelling total price, which is that field we entered right at the very start, and multiply it by 12. A cool thing about the way analytics works is it, it only sums fields that exist on usages. So the commercial building doesn't have a dwelling price, so it won't sum it on that, on that uh, feature. So there we go, 10 and a half mil uh, at full occupancy, no operating expenses. Let's keep, let's do our exact same process as we did above. Um, I'll grab another calculation and we'll say measure, grab the net, the potential multifamily yield, and let's add a occupancy number to it, A times 0 0.95. That's our assumption here. So we'll call this net yield after occupancy. And the unit is, again, it's in dollars. So we haven't lost too much there. And then the last one we need to do is NOI. And again, you all are probably much more uh, equipped to, let's do NOI multifamily to say what an operating expenses in Orlando and a multifamily building might be. I'm going to, again, make the same assumption that it's around 15%. And again, if you wanted to model these out line by line with all your known expenses, you definitely could do that too. All right, so, oh, eight five we need here. All right, that makes more sense. Last thing is let's add a seller's value, seller's valuation. Now cap rates are generally pretty, um, a little bit lower for multifamily propositions. So let's, let's think about that as 5.5, uh, .5, so A over 5.5 .5 times 100. And uh, we've got a little bit of room to play, but do we have enough room to play? That's the question. So we can see from this little calculation that the building to the seller is worth 150 mil, which is great. So there is at least some argument to say it's worth carrying the risk. But now we need to work backwards and say, all right, well, what's it gonna cost us to renovate this building? And <clears throat> I'm gonna uh, add in here a renovation expectation. And we'll go create a new metric that says, get all of the areas, the gross areas for every building type and multiply it by its hard costs, A times B. Now you'll remember for commercial, we put hard costs at zero. So that's gonna zero out the commercial, it's already built, we're not gonna do anything with it. But what are the um, refit costs on the uh, multifamily project? So we'll pop this in. Obviously, they're ridiculously high. It's going to cost us a billion dollars, people, to refit this multifamily building. That's probably wrong. So we'll call this me a multifamily refit hard costs. And now let's go and um, let's actually go and edit each one of those hard costs uh, directly from the analytics screen here. So I'll hit the edit. Ah, and you can see there's our problem. So these build costs are still in metric land, 2000 bucks a square foot, and assuming we're building them from scratch. Again, I think you're probably all way better equipped than me to come up with a hard cost for a renovation of this kind. I, from my very light research, I'm going to put in $80 a square foot, um, but I'm not going to restrict it to just the dwellings. I'm going to put it in for the, the corridor, the core, the uh, and the communal spaces. So as I do that, I can come down here and check commercial is actually indeed zero. Yes, cycle paths. We don't have any cycle paths on this project. So that's not going to be a big issue. Studios are down here. I missed any corridor, 80, core, 80, community, 80. I think we're good. So I'll hit save on that. And now our build cost is 40 million. Okay, it's still a lot. It's still an enormous amount and it's going to chew up how much capital we're willing to put into this building. So let's save that. Multifamily refit hard cost 40 mil. So then what you would expect is that what I am willing to buy for this building, what I'm willing to pay for this building um, is gonna be the value that I can get for it if I were to sell it, minus some margin. 
because I want to make money on this deal. Um, less my costs, and that should give me my buy price, right? So let's go put that in there and we'll put it in the buyer's expectation. Value to buy on. Um, we'll say this is again in dollars and we're going to take the uh, seller's valuation, A. We'll subtract, call it a 5% development fee. So we'll say A times 0 .9, uh, 0.05. That's our margin. Subtract our build costs, B, where B is our multifamily refit hard costs. Now, uh, word of caution, obviously there's more than hard costs to be considered here. There's gonna be permitting fees, financing fees, tons of fees. And if you wanted to, instead of um, just having it as a single cost, we could actually say, take the subtotal from the renovation expectation in dollars. And so we'll add in a few extra expenses and you'll see how this changes uh, the feasibility of the deal. So now I have, to me as a buyer, it's only worth 100 million, yet the seller is expecting 140 million. So really right now, it doesn't matter whether the design works, it doesn't matter how into this, to it the city is, it's a, it's a non-starter because the finances just don't make sense. So hit, let's hit save on that. And you can see the value to me and the value to the seller. So let's add a new category, we'll call this, let's make a deal. And we'll just take those two and do a difference. So what's the spread? And we'll take the billing value to the seller and we'll less it from the billing value to the buyer. A minus B. So this is how far apart we are on this fake deal, 36 million. It's a pretty big spread. <laughs> okay, so now it's the fun part where we get to kind of what if explore different factors in this deal. And we will take this and we'll we'll use it as a template. You know, obviously we've spent 35 minutes building this template. We could transplant it into different markets with different assumptions. But let's just see if we can arrive at a deal or figure out what the conditions might be or have to be in order to facilitate a deal here. First thing, if the building's truly only at 75% occupancy, they're probably not looking to sell. So let's drop our occupancy down and see how that affects it. We'll go up to net yield after occupancy and let's bring it down to more like 60%. Okay, well, immediately we're closer to a deal. The other thing we haven't done is we haven't optimized the new building. So if I open up this scenario, you can see my, I've put my market rents in, but I haven't tried to figure out what the optimal condition is in terms of studios, ones, twos, threes, to see, <laughs> excuse me, to see how, just how much we can juice the building. So let's do that. I'm gonna do these each side by side. Um, this side is configurable, this side is configurable. These we locked at two bedrooms because that's all the space that there was for them. So if I click on this guy, I'm gonna open up the algorithm and I'm just gonna start playing with the mix and watch what happens to our um, value to buyer as we optimize the potential yield. So we can probably, the first thing I might do is just get rid of threes. Often you'll find the, uh, look at our spreads down at 338K, like, but in the buyer's favor now. So actually just by changing the mix, We've, we've got a deal, a potential deal here. Um, and obviously that can get, we've only done one side here, right? So that seems like the best layout for this kind of building is around about here, 20 studios, 50 ones, uh, and 30% twos. Now, if we go back to local logic, let's see um, exactly what kind of folks we have living here. They're young, they're probably single or newly married. I think, Studios ones and twos is probably what the market wants here. So all of a sudden we're looking at something pretty interesting. Let's go back and have a look at what that is. 20, 50, 30, all right. So we'll keep studios at 20. We'll crank the ones to 50. And then holy heck, all of a sudden we're starting to make money. And not only are we making a 5%, but we've got this 5 million here. So we might actually be able to say, all right, well, even if the seller is only at 
and that's pretty pretty drastic. <laughs> Let's go back to our yield. What did we say? 0 0.6, didn't we? Yeah, that's where the deal is. So I think it, that's very interesting. And uh, to me, I'm trying to figure out what the tipping point is. And obviously there's these commercial buildings that are at 60% um, occupancy. They have probably got a significant amount of loans against them. So whilst there is a deal to be had, I can see whoever has the loan on this saying, there is no way we are taking 115 million for this building. So I don't know if that should be freak you out at all, but it's certainly playing on my mind since I've started messing with this, like what happens as all those loans mature in the major markets? I don't know. So, okay, so we've built this beautiful template. And in the last little bit, what I wanna do is take this template and just whack it on a new project in a major market and just edit some of the assumptions. Let's do that in DC, because I know DC, the city of DC are really excited to look at multifamily buildings, um, uh, these conversions. So I'm just gonna zoom out and we'll zoom into DC, wherever DC is. I keep forgetting where Washington is. Washington, DC, reveal yourself. There it is, boom. Okay, so <clears throat> let's turn on, uh, let's start a new project. And I'm going to use, oh, I haven't made this template yet. And we'll say project, project settings, use as a template. And I want this to be available for everyone. Um, you can imagine if you're a bunch of, if you're a team of brokers or if you're a team of developers looking for deals, how awesome it would be to just have this available as a template for every site that you look at. Okay, so I hit for this workspace. Now, anytime anyone logs in to draft testing, they can do this. So I'll say new project. And this time I wanna use the office to resi template. <clears throat> it's flying me back to where my screen is. So let's zip up to Washington, DC. Okay, and now I know there are some buildings along this foreshore that I was interested in when I was doing the research for this project um, that are currently office use. Um, and one of the funny things you'll find is you can start to tell the design factors really quickly. Like for instance, a corridor is eight feet. Units are probably 35 feet tops. So maximum width we can work with is really 80 feet. You can't go too much over 80 feet because if you do, it starts to get too inefficient. Um, and if I turn on lens and I'll say, okay, let's take the 3D buildings here. I wanna see which buildings, excuse me, are um, office. So I'm saying color by uh, type. And then we'll add a filter that says something like, Show me all the buildings that are office. Oh, there's one right there. Very cool. Actually, let's just use that one. So if I go look at that, I can see it's near the water. It's you know got this park or it looks like a school right here. This could be could be perfect for what we're looking for. Um, how tall is it? It's 36 feet. So what's that roughly? Uh, Holly, help me out here. How many levels is 36 feet? Not that many. Okay, it's gotta be taller than 36 feet. 36 meters is what that is because open street map is in meters. So that is 10 levels, 10 or 11 levels. It's actually perfect. Um, so let's grab this and you'll notice when I grab it, the first issue is revealing itself to me in that it's 110 feet wide. So already I know this is gonna be really tricky. Thankfully though, I'm gonna give it a go anyway. And I can see I've got all my calculations calculating live here, all my assumptions are pre-baked in. So let's just take the time and see if we can make it work regardless. So I have to set it up the way I did before and I'll take the default um, project, uh, the default layer and I'll take the shape. I just right clicked on the building and hit create. I'll create a commercial building and we want it to be 10 levels. I'll turn that onto semi-transparent and locked layer. So there's my base for the commercial building. Bang, I've already got my building expectation, no, the seller's expectation in terms of building there. Right? Second, you can sort of see the core there. It's a little hard to tell. It looks like it is center core. I don't know what this is, some kind of services, but we're just going to, again, assume a center core for the sake of simplicity here. I'll draw it like this, except this time I want to draw on the multifamily scenario. And again, I want it to be 10 layers. 
or 10 levels, I should say. Now let's, it's a weird shaped building, okay? We're gonna struggle to make it work with this L, but we're gonna give it a go anyway. So let's turn down the satellite now that we've got the core in there. Let's get our apartment algorithm out. Keep all of the assumptions. It's key when you're using a template that you would keep the assumptions, otherwise it'll stuff up your math. Um, and again, I wanna be drawing on multifamily. So let's just change that down here. I'll, I'll, uh, I'm actually gonna do something interesting here. I'll get rid of the end cap. I'm gonna draw this building in sections. I think that'll be the easiest way to do it. So I'll grab this guy with a double loaded and I'll sneak him in here. Try and get it evenly spaced. And you can see, I'm just hitting shift A and, and whipping back and forth between these modes. And I'll extrude these guys out here. Yep, I like that. I like the end cap for this building. So let's shrink that down there. And I can go a bit further out the side. And you know, we're not quite at long and skinny. It's getting close, but we're not quite there. In this back, just make sure it's shy of the core. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. And then um, what we'll do is we'll get our apartment algorithm again, keep all the existing conditions and we'll draw a strip. I think we'll draw a long skinny strip on this side. Again, no end cap because we want it to run into this corridor, but we're happy to have an end cap on the end. Although it's a weird shape there. So let's bring that back. And this is a good example of using a core draft feature, which obviously this algorithm is optimized for net new apartment builders. And we're sort of hacking it to use it in this um, use case here. It just shows the flexibility of draft. It's a fun way to use it. Um, very flexible. So let's see how far our 39 is getting close. And we'll bring this back and I'm gonna manually draw an odd shaped apartment that'll sort of come out here like an end, end cap slash penthouse kind of deal. I'll copy paste this one again, whip it around the side and you can see the issue starting to reveal itself again where that space between the core and the facade is gonna give us just dead area. Um, that is problematic. Even this corner is problematic because you can see, I have to make a decision. Do I want to extend this unit down here, have a really long weird shaped unit or do I have one unit there and then have a unit back here and some dead space there? I don't know, I'm no um, internal building expert. So we'd need an architect there, I think, to give us better advice. I'm trying to do this from the quick and fast school, see if it's worth even spending time on. So let's get this up to 10 levels. And then let's make our little adjustments. So you can see the core is just moving the corridor around, that's great. Let's add in a three better down here. I'm going to do it go halfway across and we'll have it go like that. And then I'll do one more. Three better. It goes out like this, snaps up to the side there, and then has a little kink. So I get asked this question actually a fair bit on um, even new deals, which is can I customize the floor plan for weird shaped buildings? And the answer is absolutely yes. The key with algorithms is making sure that they don't do work they shouldn't be doing. Um, and I think that's what our team have done really well with is um, optimizing these algorithms so that they don't uh, overcomplicate the problem and they can leave you as the user in control of the nuance, which every one of these, whether it's a refit or just a net new, there is issues every single time. Okay, last thing I'm gonna do is just add in that communal space in the middle. Maybe it's a basketball court, who knows? We are in DC. People are probably more likely to wanna to do this. We're, let's actually just look at that. In our five minute radius, we're even higher income earners. Uh, again, similar levels of education, although geez, we must be near a university. This is probably Georgetown that I'm destroying here <laughs> because a lot of postgrads live in this area. Again, super young, a um, lot of individuals and um, couples living together. So 94% without kids, really perfect target market for small, very expensive units. All right, let's pop back here um, and have a look at 
um, a couple of things. We have our scenario. If we go look at our numbers, how close are we? Well, wouldn't you know, we're within a deal. However, these are using Orlando numbers and we know the Orlando numbers are a little more friendly. So let's have a quick look at DC. I was looking at market rents in DC and I saw 62 bucks a square foot, which I think is much more realistic. So let's pop back here. And I'll just save this project actually. We'll call this DC office refit. And let's go just change. Let's just change all of our assumptions. We'll keep our occupancies about where they are and we'll just change our build costs, our um, rents and our rents, our dwelling rents and our um, office rents. <coughs> Okie dokie. Um, and you can tell we're still wasting some space over here. So that'd be interesting. There's a lot of, there's a lot of dead space here. I'm no design expert. All right, let's take our rents for commercial we'll go noi um oops wrong one we'll go potential rent yield i want to edit the net rents for commercial they're at 32 let's put them at 62. so this is obviously going to massively change the game yep so now we're 50 million off a deal but that's okay we've got uh dc rents to update as well um, let's go to their next, um, if I look at potential, yeah, 60% is probably about right. Let's assume that's what's driving the deal. Um, NOI multifamily, I want to change the yields for rent here, dwelling total prices on a monthly basis. But the first thing I need to do is go and just see, okay, well, what are the rents in DC? So I'm on Zillow. I know Zillow is imperfect, but let's go up there anyway. If you're in Australia, maybe you're using um, a much more reliable data set than domain or something like that. Pop down here, we can see, actually there is a fair amount of, that's our building right there, supply in the area, but maybe not because it's right by the water. It's very nice, very nice little spot. Um, rents are $2,000 a month for a zero better. <laughs> that's wild. Okay, what is a zero better? I guess that's a studio. So let's look at studios, twos, ones are threes, twos are four, crikey. I mean, these are brand new, ours are gonna be brand new too, aren't they? So let's go, let's do that. Let's say our studios are two, our ones are three, and our twos are four as a basis for this. So we'll pop that in. Oh no. Bloody hell, it's actually not that, is it? It's 3,000 for ones. It's 4,000 for twos. And I'm not even going to do threes. It just seems too ridiculous. Studios, 2,000. Okay, and, we, and just like we saw in the demographics, we're probably not going to rent that many threes anyway. So let's drop them right down. We'll hit save there. And has that changed the deal? No, it hasn't because I've done it in the wrong place. So let's go put it in the right place. One bedroom, what are you at? 2,000 bucks per dwelling, did we say? No, that was the studio. 3,000 per dwelling for ones. Let's go back to twos. 4,000 per dwelling for twos. 5,000 per dwelling for threes, just to follow the pattern and 2,000 per dwelling for studios. All right, moment of truth, people. We're much closer and now we just need to optimize, okay? So let's do the same thing we did on the other project. I'll open up the algorithm and we'll say, let's get rid of threes and let's crank the ones and twos. Uh, it's not helping us as much as it did on the other deal. Interesting. It's only a small amount of, uh, it's only a small amount. So let's come back to 2050. Okay. And then on these guys, we'll do the same. On this side, we'll go 2050, 30. You know, it's not helping us. Fascinating. There's different spreads. There's someone in the audience who's probably good with math is going, yeah, of course, man. Um, 
I guess we found another few million, but that's not what I thought it would be. Fascinating. And these on the end of threes, let's turn them into really big twos. Yeah, that was silly. Don't do that. Okay, so um, very interesting. And Holly was just messaging me on the side saying, what about the unit sizes? Another factor I haven't even thought of. So let's actually go look at the uh, DC sizes and have a quick look. 900 square foot, two bedroom apartment. Okay, what are we at? I think we're at Sydney sizes here. Let's go to one better. Oh, I have to do that here, don't I? Two bedroom units at, no, they're a little big. Let's crank them down. 900, interested in what the ones are. I um, hope this is as riveting for everyone else on the call as it is for me. One beds are 675. Six, seven, five, and studios. They said with zeros. <laughs> Let's go to studio. They are uh, four ninety two. Four forty is the smallest. Crikey. Okay. Well, let's do four forty. Let's just go hard here. Let's assume we're going to get this kind of. Oh my lord, Holly was right. Look at that. The spreads right down. So let's go around the building. No wonder the units are so small here. Let's do it again. Four forty. And what do we say? Sorry, my memory's no good. 675 for one. And these were 900, I think. Oh Lord, we are within earshot people. And then last one is the back, 440, 650, 900. Wow. I am shocked. I have just shocked myself. Well, Holly has shocked me, I should say. That is fascinating, guys. Um, I hope you found that as interesting as me. I'm going to pause there and, and let there be any questions. Um, I've really thoroughly enjoyed myself, and I appreciate you all taking the time to come along the journey with me. Does anyone have any questions, or is there anything that you would like me to explore further? Um, during the conversation, uh, Clive asked a question about um, overlaying existing known building plans into the tool. Um, I answered him in text, but if you wanted to take a moment to demonstrate how to do that, I'm sure everyone would enjoy that. Yes, I'm curious what your answer was, Holly. Uh, the way I would do that is with a PDF um, or a, a CAD file that you may have and bring it in either, either as an image or a layer. Um, so great question, Clive. If you do have the floor plan, you're saving a lot of guesswork that I did on this call. <laughs> but you would say, add data layer, create your own image PDF. Or if you have the vector work, you could just bring the vector work in directly um, and then scale it and stretch it over the building, um, either over the satellite or over the 3D buildings. Um, I don't have one on me that I could use, but I could grab any, any image that I may have in my um, in my computer here and just whack that on and, and it would be able to scale over the site. So that would give you a great set of where are the staircases, where are the elevators. And I really should have started with that. So good thinking. <clears throat> Holly, did you recommend that or did you come up with some other genius method? Yep, I gave the exact same answer. So Perfect. <laughs> big brain over here. <laughs> Love it. Um, any other questions from the group? I don't see any other questions in the chat. So unless someone um, types really fast right now, we might have uh, been clear enough for everyone, it looks like. Awesome. Well, thanks for making the time. And it's nice to see some familiar faces on the, uh, the list of attendees. So thanks for joining everybody. I hope you found it useful. Please give us a buzz if you want to talk through it in detail. Um, oh, I saw one question pop through. Same thanks. <laughs> uh, same thanks. Awesome. Well, yeah. I appreciate everybody on the call. Cheers. Bye.